Welcome to Memo Q Talks, where we talk to industry leaders about their experiences, lessons learned, and what works best across all areas of localization. Now here's your host. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Memo Q Talks. My name is Mark Schreiner, and I'll be your host for this episode of Memo Q Talks. Today, we're going to be talking with Maria Scheibengraf, who is a chartered linguist. She's also an expert translator and has expertise in marketing, transcreation, UX, UI, and SEO optimized translation. We're going to be talking to Maria specifically about SEO in the context of translation. But before we get started, let me welcome Maria. Maria, how are you? Hi, Mark. Thanks so much for having me today. My pleasure. Hey, I got to ask you, um, what is a chartered linguist? Right. So here in the UK, where I'm based, um, there's an organization that's called called the Chartered Institute of Linguists. And you can be an associate member, um, a member or a, a chartered member, which is like the highest um, a form of association because they, they, they check your CPD and your training and uh, your career, your experience. So you kind of need to qualify for that. And that's the highest um title that you can get within the CIOL, C-I-O-L, that's right. Well, it it's, sounds, sounds very impressive, and I'm sure it's um, not easy to achieve. Uh, I, like in the U.S., we have translators, and I think some people say certified translator or something like exactly. that. Exactly. It's kind of similar. Yeah. It's just that in the U.K., the, the translation profession isn't like regulated like it is maybe in the U.S. or in Argentina, where I'm from. So you've got these um, chartered associations that you join. I, was, I made a comment before our, we started this um, <clears throat> recording that uh, your Argentinian accent does not come out at all. So <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it does. When I'm really, really tired, uh, it does come out or I just switch to Spanish straight away without further, without any prior uh, warning. <laughs> does it, do, are you influenced by whoever's around you? For example, if you're talking with um, friends from South America or Spain in English, will you start to mimic their accent? Um, that's a, that's a, a good question. What happened to me was... I didn't used to have um, a British accent uh, at all. Uh, it was more of, a, of an American accent or a mixture of both. Uh, but then I came to the UK to live uh, uh, for a while um, and it, it sticks. It's it's kind of unavoidable. And I went back to Argentina to finish my translation degree. And I would be in class trying to like participate and engage with the instructors and raising my hand and stuff. And my British accent would come out and people would like turn mm-hmm. around and like, what is she doing? Like, it sounded quite ridiculous. And I was kind of being judged a bit by it. And as if I was like, um, I don't know, faking it sort of thing. And it just came out like that. So I, I was quite embarrassed. And I would try to 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 mimic my, my Argentinian friend's accent just to not stand out as much. Um, but that's, that's, that's was a long time ago. <laughs> No, I've heard of similar stories of with Japanese friends who've studied overseas and came back to Japan, and then if they start speaking English with an American accent, or if they actually just start speaking English really well at school, people are like, oh, you know, <laughs> but uh, usually younger people. Hey, if you ever really want to feel good about your accent, doesn't matter what accent it is, come to America. We love accents. Good. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and you know what? Everyone's got an accent. Like, it, in, in, your, in your own language, in your native language, everything you hear is an accent, so that's, that's fine. That's awesome. Hey, um, I, again, you have expertise in many different areas. And um, I, I, before we dig into SEO, I, I just would like to get your quick thoughts uh, because you are a translator. And, and, you know, one of the things that I tell translators, and I'm not the only one saying it, but one of the messages that is often um, out there is that if you're going to be a translator, you should think about specializing. And that could be in, for example, a specific industry or maybe in a skill set like SEO optimized translation or transcreation, et cetera. Um, clearly, you've done the work to gain those expertises. Uh, tell me a little bit about your mindset and how did that come out? Well, um, when I came out of uni, um, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And I just took on any project that came my way. Was it medical translation? Yeah, I can do that. Uh, is it finance? <laughs> I'll find a way. I'll just research a lot. And then, you, you know, you, you realize as you're doing the work that your translation is poor quality, um, that you spend too much researching, too much trying to find down the, the right answers and wasting time, especially when you're charging by the word or, you know, and, and not you're not being paid for your actual time. So 
uh, I started um, listening to translation mentors and just business coaches in general about the importance of finding a specialization and a niche and even more so a micro niche um, and how to do that. And I, I heard someone say that you should find something that you really, really like and something mm -hmm. and, and also like everything that you've done in your life kind of um, weighs in. And I had a lot of experience in sales and marketing from previous jobs I had done before becoming a freelance translator. So I thought I actually enjoyed those things and I, I think I'm good at them. So I'm going to try and, and, and focus on those. So I started with just marketing in general. And I thought I was specialized in marketing. And then I realized <laughs> that marketing is a very, very broad field. Um, and that every company that. from every industry has a marketing need of some sort so is it marketing for what type of companies that i'm doing and what sort of marketing per se that i want to do and then just clients um happened to come our way that we're in the SaaS um industry like software as a service and i also have a background um in it from high school and i thought what 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 don't you have a background <laughs> I know, right? It's just that in Argentina, people who are from Argentina will, will understand what I'm talking about. Um, you need to work a lot to make ends meet. So you end up uh, sometimes having two, three jobs simultaneously. I, I should have you coach my boys, okay? Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to, you know what? Never mind. I'm just going to send them to Argentina. <laughs> just like, well, it, sink yeah, or you, swim. You don't have a choice. You really need to like sometimes yeah. get two, three jobs and they are completely different. Uh, between each, each other uh, most of the time. So I ended up just having a background in a little bit of everything as most Argentinians <laughs> do. So I realized that I really liked programming and coding and that that could, um, you know, be married to marketing uh, if you if you focus on everything that's UX and UI and SEO and all the back end stuff. So I thought, right, this is what I want to do. Um, and I just kept taking courses and working with clients in that sector and here we are. Here we are. And it's, it's cool. Like with marketing, there are so many different rabbit holes that you can go down and it's like, oh yeah, just marketing. But like you said, there's so many different areas. I, um, I spent about, well, five years in the cybersecurity space. And when I got into it, I was like, oh, cybersecurity. But then there are so many different directions that you can go and you can never know it all. And even if you know, maybe all the potential directions, it's impossible to go deep in all those areas. But it keeps it interesting, to yeah. say the least. Just the word cybersecurity um, scares me. Like I... <laughs> <laughs> it should. <laughs> it should. <laughs> Actually, a, a, a little healthy amount of fear and caution is good for all of us these days. I mean, it, it, not a day goes by when I don't hear about somebody getting scammed, whether it's in the news or just, I mean, people that I know. And, you know, I mean, just simple stuff like it just happened this week where a friend's uh, new colleague, they got an email from the CEO saying, hey, um, sorry to bother you, but I have an urgent request. Can you go out and buy these uh, these gift cards and then um, and then get back to me? And it was it was a spoofed email address. So it looked like it was from the CEO, but it wasn't. And um, the person bought the gift cards. No. They gave them the digital information and the company. Yeah. yeah. And you just feel so bad because this is a new hire in the company. And it's like, oh, my God, I got an, I got an email from the CEO. Oh my you know, God. Like, this is my chance. <laughs> <laughs> it's so bad that people do that, right? So um, anyway, though, we're not here to talk about all that stuff. Uh, we are here to talk about SEO, which, by the way, you've written a book about the SEO translation Bible, yeah, right? Yeah, that's right. A Available on Amazon? No, it's available on our website. Um, it was, on your website? Yeah, it was okay. going to be available on Amazon originally until we, real, we realized that Amazon wanted to keep 70% of the profits. So we were like, uh, mm, no, thank Ouch. you. Ouch. <laughs> How dare they? <laughs> I know. So, yeah, it's on our website and you can download it as a PDF. Um, and, yeah, it's, okay. it's been working well so far for people who, who have read it. They've enjoyed it and they are learning a lot from it, apparently, from the reviews that we're getting. So, yeah. Good. Well, I'm going to come back to, at the end, your, your website uh, URL and the information in terms of if people want more information. So we will come back to that. Um, but let's get started on the topic of C uh, SEO. So first off, what is SEO? SEO is finding a way to make Google love you, <laughs> basically. Um, can, we, can, we get, can we get SEO for 
members of the opposite sex or whatever your target is. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you can SEO your appearance uh, if you want. Um, it's it's just it's really tricky. It's a very tricky discipline because you have to hit the sweet spot between pleasing Google and pleasing the users. Um, and more and more, Google is focusing on how much you're pleasing the users to decide whether you should be ranking on the first pages of um, the search result pages or not. So yeah, that's what SEO is. The thing is that SEO uh, is language dependent. So you can have a brand that operates across multiple markets and Google can be loving you in one market and hating you in another one. So that's where SEO translation comes in. Okay, so if we if we look at search engine optimization or SEO as uh, making Google love you, which would mean that um, when people search for whatever it is you're selling, let's just say French translation, um, that when somebody searches for trans French translation, magically Google loves you and your LSP or your um, language service provider uh, appears in the top, right? Um, what what can we do to get the love from Google? That depends on the characteristics of your business. So are you a big player? Are you a small player? What are your strengths? So uh, whole analysis is carried out before you can actually do anything on page or, or behind the scenes on your website to be able to get to what you want to get on Google's uh, results. Um, for example, we at Criso are a small business. It's just four of us we don't have the budget or the resources to compete with multinational LSPs from around the world. So we shouldn't try to. There are other strategies that we can apply where we can outperform them because Google will um, favor small businesses over large businesses when we do some things. So our strategy would probably be around um, more specific keywords like longer and and more niched keywords in our content rather than generic high competition keywords um because we will never so so meet them. so for example in this i guess what you're talking about is the long tail search right exactly. so i didn't want to get even, too technical you, <laughs> no it's it, 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 I, I'll try to keep up, but, um, and, 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 but so when you talk about very specifics, instead of the example I gave earlier of, uh, French translation, you're going to get a ton of companies that are going to respond and probably the bigger players, um, are going to come up first and that's, you're not going to be, want to compete with that. But if, if you happen to specialize in South American Spanish, the translation of, let's just say a specific type of document, um, and then you would put that in your, uh, if somebody searched for that document for South American Spanish or Argentinian Spanish, for example, would that be a little bit more specific? It would, it would, although probably yeah. those big players would be optimizing for things like a, a, keyword, like, <laughs> a keyword like Argentinian Spanish. Um, it, Argentinian Spanish is a, it's a, it's more specific than just Spanish, but it's still a very short keyword, which means that um, it will have high competition. But if I... If I go instead, and that would also be in that context, a transactional keyword or, or, or a keyword that people enter on Google when they are trying to buy something or to hire a product, uh, a service or buy a product. If I change my strategy as a small player and focus on informational keywords and providing value in my content, like what makes Argentinian Spanish different to European Spanish um, or something a lot more um, specific, like really, really specific like that. Users can come to our, a blog that we've written, for example, re read everything that we've written about it and conclude that we are experts in Argentinian Spanish because look at this 3000 word um, blog that they've put together. They, they, they know their stuff. Right. So I might give them a go. So you, you, you compete based on the content that you provide and blogs are really, really useful for small players um, to outcompete larger players. I don't know if I've made myself kind of clear. Okay. Oh, absolutely. So if you know, 
where you want to target and you can, and, and I, I assume that you recommend doing um, some kind of keyword analysis Absolutely. in terms of what people are searching and you look at those, those long tail searches, those very specific niche services, uh, services, searches that you could also then take those keywords and build a blog post or some type of content around there. So for example, at MemoQ, we, um, one of the areas that we uh, do quite well in is the gaming industry. Another one uh, is the life sciences. And so we have a lot of content that um, it talks about uh, how to optimize life sciences localization, also different trends in, in, in life sciences in the context of localization and regulations, etc. We do something similar with gaming. And hopefully that results that once people are searching for technologies related to um, life sciences translation that we appear somewhat higher in the, uh, exactly. in the results. Exactly. And you would also have to consider what your competitors are doing. So it's not just about, I was just discussing like it, the influence of the size of your business, but there's just one factor. You also need to, con um, to consider, because you might be bigger, like MemoQ, and you need to consider who else is um, who's competing with you uh, for those keywords or offering similar solutions to similar problems in your target market. Um, so that comes into play as well. You also need to consider um, how people are searching because it, like, what's the gaming industry like in everyone, every single one of your target markets? Because it might be huge in some of them, not very popular in others, and that will reflect on the searches that users are performing. So sometimes you will need to change the keywords that you're using and you don't have to translate them literally from English. You will just have to come up with um, different ones that you might might be able to adapt your content for so that users in that market will find you. Because what's the point of translating your content and putting it out there if no one's ever going to go searching for it? Totally makes sense. Um... I know in your book that you have um, a section that talks about mu multilingual SEO versus international SEO versus SEO translation. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So those terms tend to be um, confused, understandably. So international means outside the scope of your domestic market, but it doesn't have to be multilingual. If I... I am targeting Argentina, Bolivia, Chile, Spain. That's international SEO, but the language is still Spanish, so it's not multilingual. Now, multilingual SEO deals with more than one language, and um, it could be within one country. So you can have multilingual SEO that's not international. You've got several languages in Switzerland, for example, and, and you will have to target your strategy to each of those languages without ever, ever leaving the borders of that country, if that makes sense. And then SEO translation is a technique, it's a tool within multilingual SEO. It's a way of adapting your content from one language to another to achieve similar results across all markets. So, we have translators um, that listen to this podcast. We have LSPs that listen to the podcast. And we have enterprise um, companies out there that, that are paying for translation. And typically, not typically, a lot of times the goal of that translation is to bring in more customers. And so they do that through their the web content and they want to SEO. But I wouldn't say they want to. I think ideally, whether they know it or not, they should SEO optimize. Sometimes uh, companies are aware of it, sometimes they aren't. So let's look at these three different areas. If, you're, if you have a company that comes to you um, with some content that they want to translate into several different languages, um, how do you guide them down whether or not this content should be SEO optimized and, and what kind of conversation do you have with them? First of all, I mean, I need to have a talk with the marketing team or the globalization manager or whoever's in charge of international expansion because the content that they might that they are producing might not be um, publicly available. They might be writing um, uh, white papers. Uh, they might be writing such, like something for lead generation or lead nurturing that is not uh, that you can't find by googling. 
So in that case, SEO, SEO does not have any purpose. You don't, you won't benefit from it. Now, if the content that they are producing and that they want to localize is um, going to be available online, the best and most efficient way of doing things is considering SEO from the very beginning because it's a lot cheaper, efficient and faster to do it right from the beginning than to come back to it um, sometime down the line when you see that you're not ranking for the same keywords uh, that you were ranking with your English or source language content. So that's the first thing that we would address. What's the purpose of this content that you're producing? Do you want it um, to be found online or will you be doing it um, like shielding it from Google sort of thing? And then we would proceed to let them know how we carry out our keyword research and market research. They will normally provide us with insights into um, their competitors. Sometimes the messaging changes from one market to another. We're working with a fintech company at the moment that's, um, that does not have the same type of competitors in Germany as in Spain, as in the UK. They might have credit cards as their biggest competitors in Spain, but solutions like PayPal as their biggest competitors in, 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 or so forth in, in Germany. So the messaging when they are showing the value of their product will have to be adapted as well. So we need all of that information first before deciding how we approach a certain article, a certain piece of text. Okay. And then, you know, you optimize, I guess, the source text or you, you suggest that the customer optimize it, I assume. That ideally, you it well. it's, ideally, it's already optimized um, okay. um, at the copywriting stage. So before it reaches us. Then, and, and, and let's just, when I say you, let's just say that you're any LSP because I, I, you know, maybe your organization only handles a few different language, but let's just assume that a company comes to you and say, hey, you know, we've got this document um, and it's SEO optimized in English, but we want to translate this for our uh, South American websites. We want to translate it for our Asian websites um, and maybe a couple different European websites. And, 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 and of course, we want those SEO optimized as well. So what's the process of taking an SEO optimized source document and then optimizing in all these other target languages? Well, the first thing is identifying um, the main keyword in the source text and any supporting keywords a lot of the time um, the client will provide those already so that you don't have to go through the trouble of doing all that right. analysis um, and then you need to find equivalents for those keywords in the target market can i uh, just cut in for a second so if the customer is going to provide let's say they're going into chinese and they're going to say um here are the keywords that we want you to use do how do they do that? Do they work with an agency? Is that what you recommend? You work with a, a, a specialist agency for the target market? No, or so is they'll come to they, us they... And, they'll, and they'll say, uh, I've got this blog post, this 2000 word uh, blog post. The primary keyword or the keyword that we're targeting in English in this blog post is this and that, as you can see from the text. And we're also trying to rank for these other five supporting keywords. Um, we would like you to translate or transcreate this blog post into Argentinian Spanish and uh, make it rank for similar keywords. That's what they will come to us with. The keywords that they chose for the English text is not something that we deal with. They come to us after that. So they will have a marketing agency usually deal with uh, everything that's copywriting and SEO in the source language. And then they come to us when they're already getting results in the source language. So to try and replicate that success in other languages like Spanish or whatever it is that they need. So what we do is we inform them that translating those keywords word by word will not work, very rarely works. That we, what we need to do is find out how users in the target market are searching um, that concept, what what they are entering in their queries to get to information about that concept. And that's what we proceed to do. As, as I, I'm going to give an example so that this is not so abstract. We were translating um, an article that had as its primary keyword um, multimedia localization. That was the, okay. the, the English keyword, multimedia localization. The 
the literal translation of that keyword into Spanish would be localización multimedia. However, sounds better. <laughs> sounds much better in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> However, when you go and 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 check how many people are searching for localización multimedia every month, you get that nobody is using that term. But you do get results in English. People are actually using multimedia localization, yeah. but n no sure. one in Spanish is. What do you do? So what are they using in Spanish? That's that's okay, exactly so what do you do? our work. What do you do? <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly what we and need to solve. And how do you how do you figure that out? We put ourselves in the shoes of the user, and we think, right, how if if I needed this service, how would I search for it? So. Traducción multimedia, which is multimedia translation, actually does yield several um, several results, like 40, 50 a month, which means that Spanish users are not very aware of the distinction between translation and localization. But English users seem to be a lot more educated about that. So what we do is we use that we use the keyword that users are actually uh, employing themselves. And then when they get into, like when they click through and they land into the relevant page, we explain the difference and we insert supporting keywords and we make it clear that translation isn't the same as localization isn't the same as, and we explain everything that they need to know. But first we need them, we, we, need, uh, we need them to click through. So we need to use what right. they are using. Okay. Does that make sense? Totally makes uh, absolutely. Um, let me ask you this. Okay, first off, <clears throat> what is Google looking at as a priority? And I think in your book you have something said. Uh, there's an exercise. Can you read Google's mind? Um, so, so can we read Google's mind? I mean, what what are they looking for? Because I I thought it was keywords, and then for a for actual content and then for a site or an article, it would be backlinks. That's the old school version of what Google is looking for. What is really, what, what's Google looking for? How can we get their love and how can we read their mind? Right. Or so, and um, there's a key concept is that's, that's called, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> there's a key concept that's called search intent. And that is, um, well, it's, it's pretty transparent. What's the user trying to find or what's the user trying right. to achieve by entering that keyword into Google? So you've got different types of search intent. You've got informational. If I say, um, what is, um, what is haggis? If I don't know what that Scottish horrible. It's, t it's horrible. Meal <laughs> is. <laughs> And I wonder. I've eat, I, <laughs> oh. you, you, the only the only time to eat haggis is at a Bobby Burns uh, annual. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been to a Robert Burns <laughs> event. No, <I> and, uh, <laughs> he's the national poet of Scotland, and uh, haggis has something to do with it. But well, um, it's, and, it's and, horrible. And, and my, a husband, lot of whiskey. my husband loves it for New Year's Eve, and the first time he said okay. it, I'm like, "What? What was that?" So I went into Google and I typed, "What is haggis?" And that is informational search intent. I just want information about that. But then the other intents, if I cannot remember a URL, I know that, that the soft play where I take my child is called picnic, but I can't remember if it's picnic.co.uk or picnic.com, or I just go to Google and I type picnic website, and that is navigational. I'm trying to get somewhere. I'm not trying to find information about picnic. I just want Google to give me picnic's website so I can click through it and just book a slot or whatever. There are transactional um, keywords, buy high boots for women. I just type that because I am I want to see options because I want to buy one of those options. There's so what, what you're going to say is, is as a, a marketer or a business, you should anticipate what the intent of your potential buyers is and what, how Google will understand their intent is. So you, you don't want to be a location. You don't want to be a picnic. You want to be, if you're selling boots, you want to be high boots, whatever. When what you want has will change. What you want will depend. Um, but okay. like to get traffic, you ideally want to target like different intents um, throughout your copy. The thing is that you, assign the right keyword to the right result. So if I am, um, if I am something that happens to us a lot at, um, 
at Criso, we want to use translation related keywords for people for, for translation buyers searching for translation services. So mm -hmm. we want to use the word traducción somewhere in our keywords, which means translation um, to rank for that. But then what happens a lot of users enter the word the keyword traducción on Google when they are trying to get to Google Translate. Uh, right. Right. So yeah, that's what I do. Exactly. <laughs> so what's what's going to happen if if I if sometimes when in some context when you try to rank for that keyword, your the, the user that that finds your URL on the first page is not trying to find you. They are trying to find Google Translate, so they're just going to scroll past, or they they won't ever click through because you're not satisfying their search intent. So Google has become very intelligent in that sense it can anticipate the intent behind how people phrase their keywords and, and uh, how they they write them and you should try and read google's mind about what users are trying to find if that makes sense so google tries to read user minds users minds and you try to read google's mind um, and if that's a match then you'll rank high in terms of search intent a lot of mind games going on. I know. On here. <laughs> it's, a, it's a continuous exercise, though, and it's quite, it's quite interesting. I give up. I'm just going to call you and ask for help, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. I'm here. Seriously. So, so let, me, let me throw you a, a potential curveball. Do you know that expression, a curveball? Okay. Okay. I don't know if they do that in cricket or, um, yeah, but anyway. <laughs> um, what do you do in places like... Japan, Korea, and China, where they, Japan is, is, is used mostly Yahoo, but in Korea, it's neighbor and China, it's China, it's Baidu. Um, how do you optimize in those places? You, I'm not an expert in anything outside Google. So what we okay. would do at Grizzle is onboard experts in Baidu, Bing, Yahoo, et cetera, because the rules tend to be slightly different, although they all follow the principle that user experience is experience is the main thing that you should be trying to um, improve with your content, with your website, with everything that you post. If your users are happy, your content will rank. There was, um, uh, and this is, this holds true across, um, across search engines. In the, in the case of Google in particular, there was an update um, about a year ago that um, that's now it it takes things into account to rank you that could be um the speed at which your site loads sure or sure. um just if, you, if you've got videos or um, images if your images have alternative text like descriptive text anything that increases and, and improves the experience uh, of your users is going to play in your favor uh, with Google. So there's sometimes us marketers and, and, and marketing translators say that if you don't know anything about SEO and you would like to optimize your content for SEO, start by optimizing it for your users and you will be halfway there. That's the, I think that's some great advice. And by the way, I really appreciate your, your openness and honesty about um, I, you know, agreeing that certain markets have different search engine paradigms and, and, and you can't, you can't apply, uh, you know, one size fits all to the, to every market in the world. Google, Google will get you there for most of the markets, but there are some pretty big ones, China in particular, yeah. that, um, you do need some local expertise and Talk good luck you. figuring it out by the way, because <laughs> Baidu is, um, is, I, I mean, I've had worked on so many projects and <laughs> it's a, it's a black box. Um, and that's all I'm gonna say about that. Um, let me ask you <clears throat> just a few more questions here. Um, what, what, what are, what are your thoughts on, and this is kind of, we're going to kind of jump tracks. Um, you know, how important is a localized, uh, UI, which would contribute to the UX? Um, so user, user interface, um, which is going to contribute to the user experience. How much, how much of a, like, uh, a, stickler are you in terms of saying, you know what, this has to be optimized or, you know what, let's just throw the content up there. And if it's readable, it's okay. What, what are your thoughts on that? No, I'm a pro localization, uh, professional. <laughs> I really, really, um, I, I, I love localized UI and I love 
localized everything because <laughs> I okay. uh, now I understand that sometimes it's just not possible for a company to um, to go native. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> to go native for every single market that they want to um, to target. But what I would advise in that case is to start in region first and then kind of start from like, continue expanding from there rather than go global in 25 markets at the same time with half baked products. Mm. I would, uh, from experience, at least not just as a professional in the area, but as a user myself and as an app lover, I'm on my phone 23 out of 24 hours of the day. And I really hate it when, uh, when something doesn't make sense in my language as I am navigating an app and I have several, several times I have um, just abandoned an app or rejected an app and gone to a competitor just because I felt more cared for because they took the time. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? And I, I'm totally with you on that. I have um, started a registration process multiple times and then backed out of it for different apps, different sites. And it, because it was just like idiotic, the user experience was just like, it just wasn't working for me. And, and I thought, and it's weird because I felt, maybe I'm nuts, but I, I felt like I had this like emotional reaction, like these people, it's not only do they just not care, it's like they're, they're just, they're almost being overtly rude or obnoxious. They're making me jump through all these just hoops and go back and it doesn't make sense, you know, like it could be little things like drop downs where you've got to search for a date and instead of just you know, uh, what's that predictive typing where you put something in and it gives you, you've got to scroll all oh. the way, you know, you know, or country, country names. Why can't I just put it you and then, and, and then all the countries with you start up, but no, I've got to go all the way down and then get yeah, alphabetical order. And it's just like, come oh, on, man. United I mean, Kingdom, England, Great Britain. You never <laughs> know which one it's going to be, you know, you just have to right? go to, to the G and to the U and to, it's horrible. But even like sp yeah. Spanish users, um, you're in, in European, um, in Spain, sorry, um, people have two surnames, right? Right. So when they, um, want to communicate what their surnames are in English, they sometimes use a hyphen in between so that, so that nobody thinks that one is the first name and the other one's the last name. They just hyphenate them. Um, a lot of forms from badly localized apps <laughs> will not accept hyphens, will not provide um, as a second line for a second surname. And if you enter everything together, we will, they will say, actually, no space is accepted or you've gone over the character limit. So there's no way for you to oh. even <laughs> enter your whole name. How, right. how, uh. m how much more careless can that get? That's, that's a, a great example. And I'm, my, my, my blood pressure is going up as you talk about it because it's like I hate it. But hey, I, on, to go out on a positive note here, um, I, clearly you have a... Um, a lot of, lot of experience in a lot of different areas. Um, you're clearly Argentinian. Okay. <laughs> so no, but no, but I'm super, I'm super impressed. Um, if, if, if any of our listeners want to get more information about, um, projects, well, actually, let me, let me back up for a second. You know what, before I wrap this up, I did have one more question. If you're a translator, an aspiring translator out there, and you want to get some expertise in terms of SEO optimization, um, is there a certification? Is there a course? Obviously, there's a book that they could they can read, right? Um, what, what would your advice be? Well, I actually like to recommend um, my competitors in the traditional sense of the word. So there are some colleagues that have created amazing resources for SEO translation. And I will not be telling you, get my book, don't get theirs. No, get all of it. <laughs> because there okay. isn't enough uh, on SEO translation in the market. So you've got Teresa Sosa's SEO translation course. I have taken it myself and I've, I've found it to be of great value. Um, Translar Stars have SEO boot camps as well, SEO translation boot camps. Um, and then my book, obviously, <laughs> and then complement all of that with um, just normal SEO training because you can find lots of SEO training, but very little is tailored to 
how to apply it to international or multilingual SEO and to SEO translation work in particular. Are there, Are there any, uh, you know, user groups, uh, organizations, newsletters, uh, people that you follow to kind of, because, I mean, there, you know, SEO is, is the landscape is evolving daily. I mean, so what do you do to stay kind of in touch or up to date? Oh, I've taken dozens of courses from very well-renowned gurus. I just can't remember the name of them. Oh, one of them is Brian okay. Dean. Okay. Um, so everything that Brian Dean says holds true. He just predicts things and he's always right. Um, and he's, <laughs> <laughs> I just love the guy. And um, then I go to Google, Google's, um, I think it's called Garage, Google's Garage. Um, Google's Garage, okay. Yeah. So you can find lots of uh, free training there if you don't want to invest just, just yet uh, on SEO. And it's, you know, it's coming from the most authoritative source ever if you're going to be optimizing for Google. Um, sure. I would go there as well. And the resources I just mentioned on SEO translation. But then in general, there's so much, so much in the universe of SEO um, without taking SEO translation per se into account, just SEO in general. There's a lot Um I just take everything I run into. I just find something and I take the course. I see a video, I watch the video. I, I see a blog, I read the blog. It's the only way to stay um, on top of it. That's awesome. Hey, well, I, I, um, again, you've got a, a, a lot of expertise that you could share. I mean, we could talk more, a lot more about SEO and then we could talk about some of your other areas of expertise. For people who want to reach out to you either on, you know, for your translation services uh, to get a copy of your book um, or to find out more about SEO or some of your other areas of, of expertise, what's the best way to do that? Best way is uh, LinkedIn. I'm always there. Um, our okay. website as well, crisoltranslations.com. Um, that's C-R-I-S-O-L, Crisol. Um, and Instagram. We're actually, we've just hit 5,000 followers on Instagram today. So we're quite happy wow. about that. Yeah, <laughs> uh, we're always there. So what do you post on I I Instagram? I mean, I, I'm just, because you're a, a translation lot. agency. Yeah, a lot. Okay. we're not an agency. Uh, okay, sorry. We're a hybrid between a, a translation agency and a freelancer. Best of both okay. worlds. <laughs> uh, so okay. we post um, a lot of uh, useful content on SEO translation, marketing translation, UX, UI. We post um, silly stories featuring our babies. <laughs> Uh, we awesome. just keep it fun and engaging as much as we can and very informative. That's awesome. Is it okay if I put uh, links to Absolutely. those different sources into the show notes? Awesome. Well, hey, um, Maria, I've really enjoyed this conversation and um, I wish you a great 2022 and hopefully we can cross paths in person someday ah, soon. Yeah, I, I can't wait for that. <laughs> Thank you so <laughs> no much. You, 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 me and the rest of the world. Thank you, Maria. You take care. It's okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you for joining Memo Q Talks, where we talked with industry leaders about their experiences and lessons learned to gain new insights about what works best across all areas of localization. Join us next time on Memo Q Talks.